So I am going to correct the title on my, my talk a little bit and kind of do a mea culpa. Um, you know, regardless of the number of times you look through a brochure somewhere, you miss things. And my miss when I was going through is that what I'm talking about is methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, Suboxone is obviously one of those preparations, but I want to talk about buprenorphine maintenance as it's used in the OB population. And as part of my disclosure is I am no expert on this. This is one of those situations where, I don't know about you, but every time I run into these patients, and thank God it's not frequent, but they're very frustrating, they're very difficult to deal with, it's not real clear what to do and how to manage them, so I wanted to do this talk so I could get some clarity on it. The surprise was there isn't a lot out there when you really go digging through the literature, but I did get a little bit of clarity on that, and I hope to bring some of that to you, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions after the fact. So, how I'm going to approach this is I'm going to talk about the current principles of OB or opioid addiction treatment and why we're seeing the kinds of things that we're seeing now. Uh, I'm going to go through the pharmacology of these two medications, uh, compare what the outcomes are with moms and neonates, whether mom is on methadone or buprenorphine, and then talk a little bit about anesthetic management, which is really fairly up in the air still. So addiction numbers are going through the roof. I think you, you have to be living in a cave somewhere not to know what's going on in America these days. And a large part of that is being blamed on uh, the use of prescription opioids for pain and chronic pain. Uh, in 2003, there were 48,000 admissions for prescription drug abuse. Just half that number three years previously to that. And that's 2003. This is 10 years later. Who knows how much farther that's gone? In Cleveland and other places around the country, we're seeing a great deal more heroin use. It's taking off like crazy. And I just heard on the news about a month ago, they were saying that Cleveland, and Cleveland has, you know, kind of crime rate you see in any large city, but they were saying that there were more deaths in 2013 from heroin overdose than from violent crime, shooting, and traffic accidents combined. That's a pretty good chunk of people that are, are losing their lives over heroin addiction there. Back in 2000, it's either 2006 or 2007, I can't quite recall, they were estimating about 750,000 to a million Americans were addicted to heroin. That's like five, six years ago. Who knows what it is right now? And only about a quarter of those people were getting treatment. In the OB population, and this comes from ACOG, and it's about three years old, they say that they think maybe about 4.4% of the OB population is using illicit opioids. Now, this is based on self-report, so it's probably not an accurate number. It's counting on patients reporting to their obstetrician that they're using or have gone into an opioid maintenance program. Traditionally, the way to deal with these folks way back when, when nobody really knew what to do with them, was to put them through detox. they just take them into a clinic. They would give them medication to try to uh, not so much alleviate but lessen the effects of withdrawal and just let them ride it out. Problem with that is it didn't work very well. Relapse rates were very high, and obviously you didn't want to do this to somebody who was pregnant. So mine thought started to change a little bit in the mid to late 60s, and they started coming up with these opioid maintenance programs, the thought being if we take an addict and we give them some opioids so that they don't go into withdrawal, perhaps we'll have better outcomes. And so this is where you started getting methadone introduced at this point in time. Uh, made the patients functional again, they could contribute to society again, and they'd give them a long-acting dose. And then if somebody was pregnant, they would talk about whether or not they wanted to stay on the methadone or go through detox after the pregnancy in and of itself. Methadone itself is a long-acting uh, mu agonist. It's also an NMDA antagonist, but slow re release or preparations were put out there. Very long half-life, which was nice. It allowed you to do once a day or sometimes even less than that, once every other day type of dosing. It avoided the euphoria that would make somebody want to go ahead and take more drug, which was important, but it was very difficult to try to titrate. However, 
It was the only drug the FDA was approving for any kind of maintenance therapy. And they were so nervous about it that in 1973, the, legislator, the legislation decided to heavily regulate this field. So this is where you got your methadone clinics. This is where they started to come from. And they made it so onerous to be a practitioner in one of these clinics that you only had a handful of people who were willing to do this kind of medicine going out there. But it required that you go in for daily methadone. You couldn't travel. You couldn't really go anywhere. Everything kind of focused around that clinic. So you'd have to stay nearby to wherever your clinic was. And that was a huge dissatisfier. So then the thought started to come through late 1990s, 2000, that maybe there's a better way to, to manage this, that maybe we can offer something else that becomes more of an office-based approach to things. <clears throat> and buprenorphine was already out there. You may remember this medication. It's been out there for a while. It's an agonist antagonist, similar to nalbufine, but it functions different, differently. Not very, it was, at the time it was being used for acute pain therapy, and to some degree it probably still is, but it wasn't very effective at that. But somebody got the idea that maybe you could use this for addiction drug um, maintenance. So what was proposed and what um, President Clinton signed into law in 2000 was the Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000. And what this allowed for was in-office management of these folks. And in 2002, the FDA approved buprenorphine as the only medication that could be used for in-office management at this point in time. They also changed the regulations on this to make it a little bit less onerous. Physicians still needed to go and to register with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to be able to provide this service, but they didn't have to go to a separate clinic. They could do it out of their office. And lo and behold, what you saw was many more physicians becoming active in this style of medicine. In 2000, before they had this, it was just under 1,200 physicians willing to do this. By the time you got to 2007, you were at 8,000, and it's many more at this point in time. So this is a new approach to uh, opioid addiction issues. So what is buprenorphine? As I've already said, it's an agonist antagonist. It's a semi-synthetic with a very high receptor affinity. Now, when you go into the pharmacology uh, text and you look for what's a low affinity versus a high affinity opioid, they tend to give you columns. And they'll say over here is a low affinity and over here is the high affinity. And under the high affinity, you see like hydromorphone, heroin, fentanyl, morphine. Buprenorphine has 10, has a thousand times more affinity for the mu receptor than morphine. I mean, this is like the super affinity molecule on the mu receptor. And that comes with an interesting side effect. It gets onto that receptor and it sticks on like super glue. Very difficult to get off. But it's only a partial agonist. You do not get good pain relief for this. So that starts to become part of the problem as you deal with somebody's pain who is on buprenorphine. How do you get that molecule off the mu receptor? It's a kappa antagonist, so you don't get the sedation that you see with nalbufine, which is a kappa agonist. Half-life is very long. Goes 20 to 70 hours with a mean of about 37 hours. And because of that, they're able to stretch out the dosing. And for some folks, they can go to the clinic or the office and just get a, a dose every third day or so. The preparation that they take is sublingual. It's a tablet that gets put underneath the tongue. And as I've already said, it's um, the only FDA approved drug for this type of, of um, administration. As a buprenorphine only medication, it is marketed as Subutex. However, even with Subutex, they were getting reports of further drug abuse. So the thought was, how are we going to stop the drug abuse? And they started combining uh, buprenorphine with naloxone. And this creates an interesting situation as well. What they're doing is putting it in a 4 to 1 ratio. So it's like 8 milligrams of buprenorphine, 2 milligrams of, of naloxone. And the issue with that, why, and you can ask, why doesn't somebody go into to withdrawal with this? When naloxone is administered sublingually, 
It has very little or no bioavailability, so it has no effect. It's only if they take that tablet and they eat it or crush it and inject it do you get the full impact of the naloxone and they go into full withdrawal. So that is why you're seeing these preparations come out at this point in time. And right now, when you, what I can gather from the literature, this is the preferred um, preparation that is out there for uh, patients on these programs at this point in time. There's a new one out there now called uh, Subsolve. Same sort of thing, different company, but the, those are the two that are out there right now. The issue is, is this such a good idea to be doing with somebody who is pregnant? Well, what's the problem with that? Mm, the usual unnecessary exposure to the fetus. Why should we add another drug we may not necessarily need? But, and this is based on animal studies, intrauterine exposure suggests that what ends up happening is that this produces some maternal hormonal changes that act on the fetal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and causes increases in corticotropin releasing hormone and uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone itself. So you may ask, so what? Let me enlighten you. Looking at the literature, there are several compelling research and evidence-based studies that suggest there are basically four pathologic processes that lead to a common final pathway of preterm labor. One is an exaggerated inflammatory response or infection. Makes sense, we understand that. Abruption can cause a problem. Pathological uterine distension can cause a problem. And, ta-da! Premature activation of the fetal or maternal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. So I know what you're thinking. Hoyt, get on with it. I'm postprandial. I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> Stay with me for just a moment. In the non-pregnant situation, corticotropic releasing hormone is a neuromodulator. And it's in the hypothalamus. And what it does is it stimulates the release of ACTH, which acts on the adrenals, which acts and then the adrenals kick off cortisol, and that that has a negative feedback loop back to the brain itself to reduce the release of corticotropic releasing hormone. That's non-pregnancy. What happens in pregnancy is that the placenta and the placenta tissues start to produce this substance. So what you get is corticotropic releasing hormone, and it stimulates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which produces ACTH, which produces um, cortisol production. But now that cortisol, it may be having a negative feedback loop in the brain, but it's having a positive effect on the placental tissue, so it actually incites more release of that hormone itself. Now, as that happens, what also happens is those high levels of CRH produce more prostaglandin, and those prostaglandins go through and further stimulate the CRH, and you get a secondary positive loop there. And this is the current pathogenic theoretical process by which preterm labor occurs. So unfortunately for you over there, I'm going to concentrate on this over here. So for whatever reason, you get activation of this fetal uh, HPA axis. You get ACTH, works on the adrenals. Here's the cortisol. The cortisol stimulates release through the placental tissues for CRH, which then comes back and produces more of a response on the fetal action. So here's one positive loop. But CRH also, come here, activates and increases prostaglandin. In doing so, one, the prostaglandin creates more release of CRH, but those prostaglandins also go and increase activity of myometrial fibers, action on the oxytocin receptors, and before you know it, you're having contractions, the prostaglandins are causing cervical change, and preterm labor is happening. That's the concern. So what you can do is remove placental insufficiency with duloxone. And that's what people are concerned about. Now, probably why we're not seeing a lot at this point is the bioavailability of naloxone. We're not sure how much or how little gets in or if it's none at all. But still, it comes back to this question of, should we be giving it to the pregnant patient? 
and yet it is increasingly the preferred preparation that is being given to pregnant patients on an addiction program. So it's going to remain to be seen what happens at this point. What are the outcomes? How does methadone compare to buprenorphine? Uh, not a lot of comparison studies. The one I chose to look at was the Lund study that came out last year. And he looked at pretty much the same sort of things that they tend to look at in the literature. One of the things that they measure is the neonatal abstinence score. What this is is a measure of the severity of withdrawal that the neonate is going through. It's a sheet. It has all of the usual signs and symptoms of withdrawal. And each one of those has a score assigned to it one or three or two, but as you go down the sheet and you see the signs or symptoms, you mark off that it's present. It's broken down into three categories. Uh, um, CNS disturbances is one category, GI disturbances is another category, and then there's a larger category that includes vasomotor, respiratory, and metabolic disturbances. And so as the, the higher the number is, the worse the withdrawal is with that, that fetus or neonate, I should say. And as you can see here, a mother on methadone, her child has a higher NAS score than buprenorphine. Number of days in the hospital to treat the withdrawal is about twice that in the methadone patient. And the need for treatment is very high uh, if they're on methadone. And what they do is they give the neonate doses of morphine to try to lessen the, the withdrawal a little bit. So that's what the need for treatment means. Other studies pretty much support what, what Lund found at that point in time. What was interesting, though, too, is that for mom, her outcomes, it doesn't make much difference if she's on methadone or buprenorphine. She does well. It really s seems to be that it's um, the neonate that has some effect there. I only found one study that looked at comparing buprenorphine and buprenorphine plus naloxone. And in that study, what they found is when the naloxone was added, the neonates had a lower five-minute APGAR score than those who were on buprenorphine alone, and they were a little bit shorter. But when you look at <clears throat> the, the span of what's normal, they fell within the normal parameters, but they were on the lower and the shorter side. So who knows what that means? And again, mom was fine. No difference in her outcomes whether she was on buprenorphine or uh, buprenorphine with naloxone. So the therapy now, as I said before, it's sublingual, and it's a tablet that they, they uh, have been taking traditionally. And just last year, they came out with this new film. And so what they do is just slip that underneath their tongue there and let it dissolve. There are several advantages that seem to be apparent with uh, patients on this versus the uh, methadone, many of the things I've looked at and, and mentioned already. But um, the three time a week dosing is huge to a lot of women. It really allows them to kind of function going forward. So here's the problem. What do we do with these folks? Methadone is certainly a different issue for us as opposed to somebody who's on buprenorphine. And the problem with buprenorphine is how do we get it off the receptor so that if we have to give somebody an analgesic or we feel we have to give somebody an opioid, how do we make that happen? And this is where you get in some very interesting discussions with the pain management folks. There are some who feel that, yeah, very large amounts, you can eventually push it off, but they are talking such large amounts that you're going to put the patient into an ICU setting where you can really watch them as you try to push them off with mega doses of fentanyl. There are others within the field that say it's really not possible until you get farther along down that metabolic process where you're getting closer to the half-life and now you can start to work it off. And that remains to be worked out. In terms of antepartum, these patients tend to be within the system. They're already used to going in office, dealing with physicians. They tend to get prenatal care because they're already, as I said, in the system. So it's worth asking for an antenatal consult going into this. The advice currently that's out there, excuse me, is to continue usual doses. So for the methadone patient, tell her to just stay on what it is that she's on. And it's probably not going to change too much what you're going to do for them for labor. You can still go ahead and give them a neuraxial agent. You don't have to change out your narcotic. It's low dose anyway. Buprenorphine patient, same sort of thing. They don't want you to change the dose. Leave them on it. Um, but what we tend to notice is even though we can leave the usual uh, preparation in our 
uh, neuraxial um, solution, because it's not going to have an effect anyway, it's too low, they tend to not have as good a response to that level of analgesia, and you find yourself chasing them a little bit more. And I would advise that giving them more narcotic neuraxially is not going to be what's going to make things any better, because you're simply not going to move that um, buprenorphine off that mu receptor to have an effect. For the methadone patient, IV opioids can be used if you need to go down that route, but you tend to have to reduce the dose. So come in lower if you're going to give some IV opioids uh, than, than you might do otherwise. And then there have been some case reports out there about the use of benzodiazepines causing um, fatalities and excessive sedation. So they're warning you away from using anything like uh, midazolam for these kinds of cases if somebody's on methadone. Post-delivery, you might consider maintaining the epidural infusion. Uh, if she's had a C-section, consider that transversus abdominis planus block that we will be talking a little bit about tomorrow um, in terms of what that is. But other, and be aggressive with the non-opioid type of analgesics. But you do have the option with a methadone patient to try to give them a little bit of extra narcotic. This is not true with the patient on buprenorphine. So as I said before, don't worry about the fentanyl coming out of your solution or sufentanyl coming out of your solution during a labor analgesic itself. After somebody delivers, they tend to have post-delivery pain, as we all know, um, and that will be no different. I, my minimal experience with these kinds of patients is that they complain bitterly of that kind of pain afterwards. So again, if that's going to be an issue, consider leaving the um, epidural in place and maybe giving some more local anesthetic, but again, that could have the negative consequence of them not being able to move very well. If you are going to put them on a non-opioid medication, put them on a schedule. If you do it PRN, it's not going to be effective, and this is something that our OB colleagues need to understand. And you're not going to want them on Percocet or hydrocodone because of those are low affinity medications. They're not going to have an effect. Go with your non-opioid analgesics and put it around the clock for the next 48 hours. They say you can increase the buprenorphine dose up to 36 milligrams a day, but I haven't seen anything that tells me that's effective in this particular situation. That was used in a situation for uh, post-surgical patients, but I'm putting it out there. For cesarean delivery, give what you normally give except omit the Duramorph. And the reason I'm telling you to omit the Duramorph is because Duramorph intrathecal or epidural Duramorph um, administration usually comes with a protocol, and now you're limiting what you can do for that patient because of protocol limitations. You've given this neuraxial opioid, and now we all have these protocols that say you can't give them anything else. You're probably better taking it out and then dealing with them after the fact using other types of things. Fentanyl is considered to have the highest mu affinity behind buprenorphine higher than morphine, and so the pain management folks tell you this is what you should be pushing if you're going to push something, but again, they're talking about very, very scarily high doses to do this. Consider going with a tap block, again, post-surgery. Again, my experience has not been great with this, but it's, a, it's an option to be able to, to use for these folks, or maybe even continue an epidural if you still have that in place. As I already alluded to, so I'm not going to spend much more time on this because my time is limited here. If you're going to try to push off the buprenorphine, one of it is timing. How close are you to that half-life? The other thing is you're probably looking at such large doses, you need to put these people into an ICU setting so that you can watch them. I would say if you have a pain service, consider getting them involved at the time that you have the antepartum consultation so that they're aware and they can help you try to manage these patients. They've had much more experience. Uh, I think, than we have, and they can be very beneficial. But you're going to go heavy into your non-opioid adjuvant types of medications. So in summary, these are very, very challenging patients. They're very difficult to deal with. And they're not very satisfying because it seems like you're always chasing them many times to try to get on top of what their pain issues are. I think going forward, because you do have the better neonatal outcomes with the buprenorphine, that's what you're going to see pa uh, pregnant patients on and not so much the methadone. So we need to kind of work through the research on this. 
Stay with your routine regimens. The only thing I would say, as I said before, is to take out the Duramorph so you're free to deal with these patients afterwards. Duramorph is not going to be of any benefit to them. Get your pain service involved early on so they can support you on this. Sit down with your OB, sit down with the patient, sit down with everybody, and set expectations and next moves. So as you're going into the labor or C-section, everybody's on the same page with these patients, and they don't do something that isn't going to be beneficial. And if you do decide to try to push that receptor off, have your pain service guys there with you, and use fentanyl in an ICU setting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.